if there's one thing we share in common, it's that we like to know where we stand. So whenever we walk into a new situation, we're always checking out where we fit in. We're measuring how we're being perceived. Uh, where do we fit sociologically, demographically, economically, perhaps politically, or perhaps even theologically or ecclesiastically? Where do we fit? How am I on intelligence and expertise and experience? Uh, what about fashion? Am I up with it? Uh, will I be liked? Will I be able to make these people laugh or will I be laughed at? Where do we stand? Many people will want to know where they stand with their new bishop. But don't worry about that. Their new bishop will also be wanting to know where he stands with people. It starts early, doesn't it, with that dreadful practice where two peers are chosen as team captains and are choosing people for their soccer team. Well, I have to tell you that inevitably Calder was the last name to be called. And you could hear the resignation in the potential captain's voice that he had to end up with Calder on his team. Only matched by my resignation that I had to play in the first place. But at least I knew where I stood and we'd like to know where we stand. The first few dates are like this too, aren't they? Or at least they are for guys. We like to know where we stand. How am I coming across? Am I doing all right? Uh, is my breath okay? Does she like me? Am I saying the right thing? Am I being witty and intelligent and engaging? Will she come out with me again? I, I know the Lord was saving the best to last in Susan, but I consider that I missed out on a few early opportunities because I simply didn't know where I stood. And we'd like to know where we stand. Let me ask you, do you know where you stand when it comes to God? Uh, if, sadly, you were in the last days of your life, facing the end, would you be confident of where you stand with God when you pass away? Or, or do you think that's something that you can never be sure of? Historically, people have taken up different positions on this issue. Some have thought, no, you can never know. All you can do is do your best and cross your fingers. And there are others who reckon they know where they stand because, well, they've lived pretty good lives and never done anything major wrong. These people are confident of their own righteousness and as a result, they tend to look down on others. Jesus sets up a typical example of just such people in the story we read from Luke 18. It's a made-up story that Jesus makes up to address this very important situation. His example, the Pharisee. Now, if you're not up with your first century Judaistic history, a Pharisee was a leader, a very important leader in the life uh, of Judaism in the first century. He knew the law backwards and wanted to ensure that it was being kept. And the Pharisee in Jesus' story has worked out where he stands with God. He tells God all about it. He's worked out where he stands because on the negative side, he's not like others, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, tax collectors. That has to count for something, surely, doesn't it? I mean, surely there's no hope for the likes of them, he thinks. And as I'm not even close to being like them, then surely I'm already halfway up the ladder, he assumes. And then on the positive side, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. That was more than what was required. That has to put me up the latter, so he assumes. So there he is, confident of his own righteousness. We can understand this guy, can't we? On the appearance of things, he's looking pretty good. His performance seems impressive. We understand his confidence. Indeed, many today share his confidence. Pretty confident of where they stand with God because on the scale they use, they come up pretty high. I'm not a robber. I've never cheated on my wife. I'm not dishonest in the workplace. That has to count for something. And on the other side of the scale, I grew up in a Christian home. I went to a church school. I helped out in church as, as a kid, uh, as a teenager. I taught Sunday school. I try to give to others. I'm good for those who work with me. I give regularly to charity. I, I get to church when I can. Surely those things have to count for something, don't they? Have I described you this morning? Confident of your own righteousness? Pretty sure of where you stand with God because, well, you're not perfect. But when you compare yourself to others, you're doing pretty well. Can I say I completely understand where you're at? 
It's the way life works in every other area, doesn't it? Put in a good performance when compared to others and you'll do well. School, uni, career, politics, on the land, whatever. Put in the hard work, re reward is performance based. It's the way life works. It's just not the way it works when it comes to God. And what Jesus has to say about it is quite confronting. In fact, some who first heard Jesus' story would have been outraged because Jesus said it's the tax collector who went home right with God and not the Pharisee. What? The tax collector could be sure of where he stood with God? The guy's made a living ripping people off. He collects taxes for the foreign occupiers of Israel, the Romans. The guy who in the end is an extortionist, a thief, a robber. And he's a traitor to Israel because he's collecting for the Romans. He goes home knowing where he stands with God. How can that possibly be? What did he have that the Pharisee didn't? Humility. He stood at a distance, not even looking up to heaven. He has sorrow in his heart for his failings. You can hear it in his voice. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He has a realistic view of himself and his failings. And he trusts in God's mercy. That's what he's come to ask for. The only thing he asks for, the mercy of God. The trouble with the Pharisee and those today who can relate to him, and I want to put this as kindly as I can, the trouble is that they have an unrealistic understanding, an inflated understanding of just how good they are. And I understand it completely because it's, what's the, it's what the church has been heard to say for decades. Do good, put in a good performance, follow the rules, all will be well. And so many are left with no alternative. But to assume that because they're not getting locked up for crimes, because there is a demonstrable difference between their behaviour and that of so many others, then they must be okay. The only trouble is that this is never what the Bible has said. Knowing where you stand with God was never about your performance, never about being confident about how good you are. It's all about being humble and remorseful for your failure. It's about trusting God's mercy. It's about having a realistic view of your failings and admitting those to God. Let, let's think about sin for a moment. People have made a grave mistake when it comes to sin. They, they think of it as doing naughty things wrong. And because they can't think of a time when they've been naughty, they assume they are without sin. But friends, the first commandment is not about being naughty, do you remember? It's about having any other God than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or, or as Jesus summarised the law, it's about loving God with your whole heart and soul and mind and strength. You see, most of my sin you will never see. The God I serve most often, other than the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is me. And when I push God out, my sin goes on in here. See, I manage for most of the time, except perhaps when I'm at home, I, I manage to keep up an air of respectability for all to see. But when I replace God with me, well, you don't want to know what goes on up here. What I think of others, what I want that belongs to others, Lust and resentment and judging others. All of that stuff happens when I push God aside and become God in my little world. And because he's human, the Pharisee had exactly the same things going on in his head, but he wasn't prepared to admit it or he thought that his public pretensions made up for his private failures. And you have the same things going on inside your head. You know what goes on inside your head when you push God aside and take up that role for yourself. And God knows too. 
But the brilliant thing is, even though we are so flawed, God longs to forgive us and set about changing us. In fact, to make forgiveness possible, his son bore the punishment for me as he died on the cross so that I could be completely forgiven and wonderfully reconciled to the Father. And all the Lord wants to hear from us is God have mercy on me, a sinner. For there is a principle here that Jesus explains that everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So everyone, like the Pharisee, who is proud of their own goodness and all that they've done or not done, one day they'll come crashing down in the face of God's judgment. But on the other hand, everyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. Everyone who is prepared, that is, to admit that they've mucked it up with God and come with humility and sorrow and throwing themselves on God's mercy with a realistic view of their failings, God will only lift them up. He will lift them up out of their failure and out of their sorrow and he'll freely forgive them and he'll make them his children and he'll give them the free gift of eternal life. How brilliant is that? A staggering and wonderful reality. I saw a brilliant example of this uh, principle a couple of months back on our televisions. This example that everyone who exalts themselves will be humbled and everyone who humbles themselves will be exalted. It was plain for all to see on The Bachelor. I don't know whether you saw the final. It's the only episode, episode I normally watch. I'll cut a long story short. But on the final night of The Bachelor, it is revealed which girl The Bachelor has finally chosen. For only two remain from an original 28. Uh, The two finalists this year were Abby and Chelsea. It's a very dramatic build-up to the final reveal of who The Bachelor has chosen. Uh, But through social media we had a pretty good idea of who the viewer's favourite was at least. But the audience was left hanging, left guessing for moments, well, for half an hour basically. But there was a marked difference in the attitude of the two girls. Abby backed herself. She just couldn't believe that The Bachelor would choose anyone else other than her. Meanwhile, Chelsea spent the morning crying because she was convinced that she was blown it, that she had blown it, and that there was no way The Bachelor would choose her. Well, finally, The Bachelor told Abby that his love lay with another. She was flawed, absolutely flabbergasted. And then, after a few more ads, The Bachelor told Chelsea that he loved her. Abby couldn't believe it wouldn't be her. Chelsea couldn't believe that it would be her. Abby had exalted herself and was sadly humbled. Chelsea, having approached the final with humility, was exalted. Now, friends, when it comes to God, there's a lot more riding on it then who wins a reality TV show? So let's be clear. If you approach God with a self-confident righteousness, backing yourself all the way before him, because there's just no way you're not okay with him, then sadly, you will be humbled. But if you come before God, knowing that you're undeserving, aware of your failings, and completely dependent on God's mercy. If you come with that attitude that, Lord, I, couldn't, I can't believe you would want me in your family. I can't believe you would offer me your forgiveness. I can't believe that you would give me eternal life. Then you will be exalted. Do you know where you stand with your heavenly father? 
Not because you're confident of your own righteousness and look down on everybody else, but because you've come in humility and sorrow, trusting in God's mercy, a realistic view of your failings, and you have said words to the effect of, God have mercy on me, a sinner. You may have always lived with that attitude, attitude, or my, you may have come 20, 30 years ago, five years ago, 10, 10 weeks ago, whenever it was. But if that is you, go home again today with a thankful heart, knowing exactly where you stand with God. Not because you're good, but because he is good. Or it, it may be that you've seen things in a new light as a result of what I've been saying. It may be that up to this point you have been confident of your own righteousness, but you feel God has been speaking to you right now. Speaking to you about the true nature of failure. And I, I want to urge you to come even now with humility and sorrow. Come and say to God right now, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you will know the joy of forgiveness and the certainty of knowing where you stand with God. Friends, this is the best news ever. The most liberating and life-giving news. News for a dry and parched land. Parched both physically and spiritually. News of a hope and a future where it seems there is none. And this new bishop will be going on about all this good news until his time is done.